Hi, and welcome again to my series of videos for General Chemistry 2. In today's video, I want to tell you how we found out one of the most interesting facts we know about the world. It turns out that the Earth was formed about 4.4 billion years ago. That's a fact you've probably heard in other classes, and maybe even before you were in high school. But how do we know that? And more important for us, what's it got to do with chemistry? It turns out that in order to understand the age of the Earth, we need to understand some of the same ideas we talked about in the last video. In that video, we talked about rate laws, and we saw that a rate law is an equation that tells us how the rate of a chemical reaction is connected to the concentrations of the reactants. We saw that every chemical reaction has its own rate law, and they all have the same format. Rate equals K, the rate law constant, times the concentration of each reactant each raised to a power, which is usually an integer. We also said that the exponents tell us the reaction order for the reaction. It turns out that a vast majority of all chemical reactions are either first order or second order, which means that the exponents are either 1 or 2. And, as I mentioned at the end of the last video, all chemical reactions with the same reaction order have some important things in common. So, in this video, we'll just talk about first-order reactions. Suppose we have a very simple reaction like this, in which there's one reactant and it forms one product. If it's a first-order reaction, what will be the rate law? From our previous discussion, you know that the rate law will be rate equals K times the concentration of each reactant raised to an exponent. Since this reaction only has one reactant, that means A will be the only reactant in the rate law. Also, since we know it's a first order reaction, we know the exponent is 1. Since A to the first power is just equal to A, I'll stop writing the exponent from here on out. This is a good time to ask the question, what's a rate law for? What good does it do us to know it? Well, one of the useful things we might want to know about a reaction is, how long will it take? For example, if we perform a reaction and we let it continue for one hour, how much product will we get? Or if we need a certain amount of product, how long will it take the reaction to make it? It turns out that we can use the rate law to answer those questions. But first, we need to perform a little math in order to rewrite this rate law to get an equation that ties together the concentration and the time. To do that, we need to use calculus. But I know many people taking general chemistry probably haven't had calculus yet, so I'm going to skip the math and just give you the answer. You'll get to learn about the math behind it if you take a course in physical chemistry, which I hope you will. Anyway, if we do that bit of calculus, we get this equation. Here, ln is called the natural logarithm, which I'll talk more about in a second. a0 is the initial concentration, and at is the concentration at a later time, t k is the rate law constant we had in the rate law, and t is the time. So this equation ties together the beginning and ending concentrations and the amount of time that's passed. We'll use this equation in just a moment, but before we do that, we need to know a little bit about the logarithm. To understand the natural logarithm, we need to know about the number e. e is a number that is a constant similar to the number pi, which you know about from geometry and trig. It's a number that pops up in many situations in nature, just like pi does. You might remember that pi has an infinite number of decimal places. It's 3.141592653359 and so on. It continues on without ever repeating. E is similar. It's 2.718281825. Eight four five nine and so on. It's not necessary for you to memorize this number, but in this part of the course you will need a calculator that can perform logarithms. You may never have run into the number e before, but it gets used in a lot of practical applications in real life. It's important in economics and finance when you want to calculate compound interest. It pops up when you want to use a bell-shaped curve to determine probabilities. And you can even use it when you're looking at the ways in which living things grow, like snail shells and fern leaves. And, as you're about to find out, it's also important for the rates of chemical reactions. So, what's the connection between logarithms and E? 
the natural log of x is the number we would have to raise e to in order to get x. So, for example, the logarithm of 100 is 4.6052. What that means is that if we take e and raise it to the power 4.6052, we get 100. If you have a scientific calculator, you should have a button on it that allows you to take the logarithm. Notice that there's also a button that says log on it. This is a different type of logarithm and would give you a different result. Be careful to use ln, the button for natural logarithm, and not the button that says log. So let's get back to our equation for first order reactions and see how we use logarithms in it. Suppose we have this reaction, which is a first order reaction with a rate constant of 4.80 times 10 to the minus 4 seconds to the minus 1. The concentration of the reactant, dinitrogen pentoxide, starts out at 1.65 times 10 to the minus 2 molar. How long will it take for the concentration to decrease to 1.00 times 10 to the minus 2? We have this equation for first order reactions. We're looking for t, the time the reaction will take, and we have everything else we need for the concentration. We'll plug our values into the equation. The first thing we should do is solve the logarithm. One thing that's important to know is that we should not take the logarithm for each part of the fraction and then divide them. Instead, we should divide the two concentrations in the fraction first and then take the logarithm. So the fraction gives us 1.65. We take the logarithm, which gives us 0 0.5008. And now we'll solve for t, which gives us 1,043 seconds. Let's try another problem. Suppose we perform the same reaction, and still starting with a concentration of 1.65 times 10 to the minus 2 molars. What will be the concentration after the reaction has been going for 15 minutes? We used the same equation as last time, but this time our unknown isn't t. We know the amount of time that's gone by. Instead, our unknown is the final concentration, which is down in the denominator. We'll plug the rest of our data into the equation. Remember, our value for the rate constant includes seconds as part of its unit, so we have to convert the time into seconds as well. On the right side, we multiply our two numbers to get 0.432. But what about the left side? We can't just multiply both sides by the denominator because the logarithm affects the whole fraction. Instead, we have to get rid of the logarithm first. Fortunately, there is a way we can do that. Remember, the logarithm of x is the number we need to raise e to in order to get x. So this fraction is equal to e to the 0.432 power. This is a technique you can use whenever you have a logarithm in an equation and you need to get rid of it. If the logarithm is the only thing on one side of the equal sign, you can remove the logarithm by raising e to the power of what's ever on the other side of the equal sign. If we solve the right side of this equation, we get 1.54. Now we can solve for the final concentration, which turns out to be 1.07 times 10 to the minus 2 molar. There's another useful property of first order reactions you've probably heard of, the half-life. The half-life of a chemical reaction is the amount of time it takes for half of the reactants to react. Let's start by thinking about the equation we got for our first order reactions. I just mentioned that at the half-life, half of the reactants have been used up. So the concentration of reactant will be half of the original concentration. So we'll put that down here in the denominator. If you look carefully at this fraction, you'll see that the concentrations will cancel out. So the left side of the equation is just the logarithm of 2. The time at which this happens is the half-life, so we'll put a little subscript 1 half on the t to remind us about that. This is a useful equation. If we know the half-life, k is easy to get, and vice versa. Let's try an example. In the previous problem, where we were working with dinitrogen pentoxide, what was the half-life of this reaction? All we need to know is the rate constant, and that was given in the previous problem. 
it was 4.80 times 10 to the minus 4 seconds to the minus 1. If we use that in this equation and solve for the half-life, that gives us 1,444 seconds. So, what does that tell us about the reaction? After 1,444 seconds, half of the reactants will be gone. And there's an interesting consequence of that. Suppose we started off with a 10 molar concentration. After 1,444 seconds, half of it would be gone, so we'd have a 5 molar concentration. But what about 1,444 seconds after that? The concentration wouldn't go all the way down to zero. Instead, it would be half of what was left so we'd have 2.5 molars of reactant left. After another 1,444 seconds, we'd have 1.25 molars. And after 1,444 more seconds after that, it would be down to 0.625 molar. Every time a half-life goes by, the concentration decreases by half. Let's try one more example that'll tie together everything that we've looked at today. Suppose we have a first-order reaction in which we start with a concentration of 0.800 molar, and after 20 minutes, the concentration is down to 0.259 molar. What's the half-life of this reaction? To find the half-life, we'll use this equation. It's the only equation we know so far that has half-life in it. But unfortunately, in order to use it, we need to know k, the rate constant. How can we find out what k is? Luckily, we learned another equation for first-order reactions, and this one will allow us to figure out k. Our problem tells us the beginning and ending concentrations, and the amount of time, so we'll be able to use this equation to get k. First, we plug in our values. Notice that I left the time in minutes. In previous problems, we had our time in seconds, but it's okay to use any unit of time, seconds, minutes, or even years. The only thing to watch out for is that whatever unit you use, you'll need to use the same unit in your value for k. So, we'll solve the left side first. Remember to calculate the fraction before you take the logarithm. The fraction is equal to 3.09, and when we take the logarithm, we get 1.128. Solving for k gives us 0.0564 minutes to the minus 1. Now we can use this value for k in our other equation in order to figure out the half-life. When we do, we get a half-life of 12.3 minutes. And that brings us to the age of the Earth, which I mentioned at the beginning of the video. It turns out that many kinds of minerals in the Earth contain radioactive elements, like uranium. As we'll see later in this course, when an element emits radiation, the result is usually a different isotope. So, for example, the most common type of radioactivity in uranium causes it to become the element thorium. It turns out that this is a first-order process, just like the chemical reactions we've been looking at. So, we can use the same equations to study radioactivity. That's exactly what Bertram Boltwood did in 1907. He studied several different minerals that contain uranium from around the world. By looking at the amount of uranium and thorium in the rocks, he was able to figure out T, the amount of time the radioactivity had been going on. That told him how old the rocks were. What he found out was that the oldest rocks he had were about 2.2 billion years old. That was much longer than anyone realized that the Earth had existed. Today, we've discovered rocks that are even older, over 4 billion years old, in places like Central Australia. But Boltwood's work was the first proof we had that the Earth was billions of years old, and we still use some of the same methods that were pioneered by him in order to find the ages of rocks now. Well, that's enough new material for today. In the next video, we'll talk more about what we can learn about first-order reactions, and we'll also start looking at the other most common type of reaction, which are second-order. I hope you'll join me for that. Until then, have a good week!